do a jig to keep you guys away. The bottom advances, and that's going backwards. Bottom advances, oh, okay, this is going to confuse me. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Rich, for that introduction. Um, I was sitting around thinking just the other day how many hours uh, I spend on this topic. Um, I was fortunate uh, in that I was able to retire early about 12 years ago from the semiconductor field. So that's allowed me to spend, I, I think I average uh, 10 hours a week on this subject, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, I actually did some figuring and I, I realized I've spent more time on this topic than earning my chemistry degree. Um, and if you don't believe that, call my wife and ask her. She will tell you I spend way too much time on this topic. Um, but I'm going to uh, spend a little time going through uh, these slides. I'm going to press the bottom to go forward. And <clears throat> th this, this slide just kind of tells you what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to give you a little background on how we got involved in this case and a little of the methodology that we used in developing the research we did on the case. And then Peter and I are going to go, well first, before Peter and I do that, we're going to show you a really interesting video. Uh, it was, it was uh, developed by a guy by the name of, I recall it, Dave Beatty. Dave Beatty. Thank you, Rich. Uh, a lot of times you see a recreation of a video and the media just dramatizes and it's, it's just totally worthless. But he actually did a great job. There are a few errors in it, but nothing major. I think you'll really like this video. It will be about 10 minutes. Um, and then Peter and I are going to go through three basic times in the video where we are able to calculate acceleration, velocity, and power values. So I want, as we go through each of those, for you to think, okay, what could be an explanation as to why this didn't occur. And then when we go towards the end of the presentation, then I will uh, do a little permutations and probabilities, kind of like the Drake equation, to show what's the odds that this event did not occur. All right, so we spent uh, a little bit over two years. Um, I first began investigating this case in the middle of 2016. Um, we, the report itself took a little bit over a year to complete. It's uh, a total of 270 pages. Now the bulk of that are appendices. The basic report itself is 21 pages. And we should have that released to the public within a few weeks, I think. Uh, but you will hear the, the crux of the case, which is three times that we calculate acceleration values. Uh, the case was also peer-reviewed, and you can see up on the screen, uh, our peer review team. This is an SCU team. It is led by Dr. Paul Kingsbury. He's a professor uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, I happened to meet him because we're both Everton Football Club fans. I don't know if any of you are Premier League fans, but those are the teams that we support. And then uh, Dr. S.A. Little, she has a PhD in geophysics of the ocean. It's what I just call oceanography, but it's much more uh, interesting. And then Dr. Brandon Riddell, whose PhD is in physics, and Dr. Errol Baruch, whose PhD is in chemistry. So they reviewed what we wrote, and that's why it took us as long as it did. Uh, because of the number of pages, there's, there could be an error in the report that they didn't see, so the authors will take responsibility for all the mistakes <laughs> in this report. Uh, to give you a little context of where this took place, and uh, I don't know, for any of you in here who are under 30, this is called a map. <laughs> Uh, the lower part of the screen is Baja, California, and you see Western California. 
uh, Carrier Strike Group 11 is, it was about 80 miles southwest of San Diego, and the actual encounter was another 60 uh, miles to the west. And the objects they were seeing were coming from Santa, uh, the Catalina Islands, uh, moving, moving south. This is a U.S. carrier strike group. The United States has 10 of those. I think it's worthwhile to let you know a little bit about a carrier strike group. It is one amazing piece of military capability. I guess if Travis was here, he would love this, but being a, uh, I guess you might say an independent, I'm never big on military, but it is definitely interesting. Um, it consists of a Nimitz-class nuclear carrier. There will be a Ticonderoga-class a missile cruiser, two Arleigh Burke destroyers, and then a supply ship. And then the, cru the uh, Nimitz-class cruiser, excuse me, Nimitz-class carrier, will handle 60 to 70 aircraft. And those are normally Marine Hornets, Navy Super Hornets, and then um, the E-2 Hawkeye, which is a radar-type uh, long-range aircraft. These, let's see if I get the pointer to work. In this particular case, the Nimitz-class Nimitz class carrier was the USS Nimitz. And that's right there. That is the Nimitz. That is the USS Princeton. That's the Ticonderoga class. This is an E-2 Hawkeye. You can see the giant radar dish. These are two Super Hornets, and those each have two pilots. And this is a regular Hornet. The Marines fly those. That's a single pilot. The other thing to tell you about this that you should know is that the Spy-1 radar is run by the USS Princeton. This is back in the year 2004. Each of these ships have multiple radar systems, including the destroyers, which I don't have here. There's also a attack submarine, and of course the E-2 Hawkeye has radar. The Aegis system connects all the radar from all these systems, so that when they see a radar target, right, if you only have it from one ship, well then you can, you'll have to worry about, okay, is this real or not real? If it's from multiple ships, the likelihood that it's real increases. And that system is designed to verify targets. And additionally, what you have to realize is these ships are not right next to each other. They're miles apart. So you've got radar systems at different geographic locations looking at a target that's moving. These, uh, what you see here are the actual uh, names of the various units that were involved. Everyone was in fairly close proximity of the event, except for the two destroyers. Okay, let me give you a little methodology and kind of how this all happened. So in the middle of 2016, I run across a U.S. Navy blog and it tells you this story. What was interesting to me was it was not a UFO blog, so there was a big plus sign right off the bat. And all the terminology is written in Navy lingo. So I actually had to go research, you know, what is a WSO? What is a CIC? Because I'm reading through this, and I'm like, what is this guy talking about? Uh, the author of the Navy blog, he starts off, he calls his, this particular article, The X-Files. And that's not what he writes about. He writes about fighter pilots. But he's got one unique article, The X-Files. And he starts off by saying, you know, before I even begin, I need to tell you about this commander who had this experience. Because he wanted the readers to realize this guy was a very strong, reliable, dependable commander. And so that's where I first found it. So I read that and I said, you know, I think there's something to this. 
So the first thing I do is I generate about 20 FOIAs to the U.S. Navy. Every U.S. Navy group you can think of. So most of them give me replies back. We have no information responsive to your request. However, Dr. Travis probably would not appreciate this, but I then appealed for that information. So I appealed to Navy JAG, and I copied my congressman. That kind of got them going. So then I get back on, after the appeal, they kind of throw me a bone. They don't give me a lot of information. But I get these emails back from lieutenant colonels in the Navy, excuse me, in the Marines. Sorry, any Marines. I know you guys hate to be confused with the Navy. So I get back this, these emails that say, Tic Tacs? Oh yeah, we know all about the Tic Tacs. We've all seen these videos, we just traded them on the ship and watched them. At that point, I knew this story really had legs. So the next thing I did is I went to Facebook and I went to all the military sites for the USS Princeton, for the USS Nimitz. For all, the, for all the destroyer groups. What do I find? I find Navy guys talking about this. So I know this happened. So that's kind of the story. Now, before we go and see the video and get into calculations on acceleration and velocity, I think it's important that you know the quality of the witnesses. There were over 20 witnesses but there were four that were very strong, and I list them here. Commander David Fraber, he's the commander of the entire Navy Squadron VFA-41, which is on the USS Nimitz. He's an Annapolis graduate. He has several hours of flight time. Lieutenant Commander James Slate, also a Naval graduate. He's the number two in command. Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Kurth, he's the commander of the Marine Squadron. He is involved in this instance. Senior Chief Kevin Day, he is an enlisted man, but he is very near as high as you can go in enlisted ranks in the Navy. And I think the best way to qualify him is what his commander wrote on his review. He stated, <laughs> He is my number one senior chief petty officer, a recognized expert in air defense. His impact within the Nimitz strike group, strike group has been phenomenal. He was responsible not just for the Princeton, but the Princeton's responsible for the entire strike group's defensive capabilities and their radar system. So now we get to something that I hope you enjoy, and that's going to be a short video by David Beatty. And I've cut it down a little bit. It will be about 10 minutes. There's a few mistakes, like he says it occurs southeast of San Diego. That would be in the Baja. So it didn't happen there, it was southwest. But there's very few errors, and he does a very good job of not dramatizing this event. So we'll go ahead and play the video now. Sunday, November 14th, 2004, morning, 90 miles southeast of San Diego, California, in the Naval Operations Area, the Nimitz Carrier Strike Group and her complement of warships and the aircraft of Air Wing 11 are conducting a routine two-week training exercise. The Nimitz deck crew is busy launching F-A-18F Super Hornets, helicopters, and E-2 Hawkeye electronic warfare planes. The mission? Simulated air defense or ADAX training over the Pacific. The winds are calm, the skies are clear, a near perfect day for flying. Nearby, the guided missile cruiser USS Princeton has been tracking unknown aircraft that appear and disappear from her sophisticated Aegis radar screens. 
The SPY-1 radar is one of the most advanced sensors ever deployed. Princeton's main role is air defense of the strike group. For the past few days, Senior Chief Kevin Day has noticed these peculiar craft appearing on his radar screen. In some cases, they seem to descend from space and then suddenly plunge to near sea level in seconds. Coupled with the unidentified nature of the craft and lack of clearance, these extreme flight observations are very troubling to the crew assigned to protect the carrier group from aerial threats. In this case, we were a little bit southwest of San Diego, uh, usually about 60, 70 miles off the coast. I don't know exactly where it was at that day. And we were getting ready to do an air defense exercise. On this morning, pilot David Fravor of the VFA-41 Black Aces Fighter Squadron and his wingmen prepared a launch from Nimitz for the air defense training exercises. As they launch their FA-18s, they have no knowledge of the events happening nearby. In this event, we, we rendezvous at the cap, so we're going to come off the uh, aircraft carrier, we're going to climb up 20,000 feet, we're going to go to our point about 40 miles south, we're going to hold, wait for the other airplane. So it's 25 miles separation. Dave's two-seater Super Hornet is Fast Eagle, and his wingman's jet is Fast Eagle 100. Commander Fravor leads the Black Aces and has over a decade in the air wing. But his wingman for the day is a new pilot, a young officer on her first carrier deployment. She's paired with Lieutenant Commander Jim Clean Slate, her backseat weapon systems officer, for the mission. Jim will manage navigation and the advanced radar and targeting pods on the aircraft. Overhead, an E-2 Hawkeye from the Wall Banger Squadron is on station directing the aircraft. Banger provides eye-in-the-sky command and control during carrier flight operations. Back in the Combat Information Center on Princeton, the mysterious objects are back. And today is the first time Senior Chief Day has jets in the air that can intercept the mysterious aircraft. Day briefs the captain, and they agree to send the Hornets. The air intercept controller aboard Princeton, call sign Charlie, radios the Hawkeye and takes control of Fast Eagle. Banger, Charlie, over. Charlie's a banger, go ahead, over. Banger, Charlie, do you hold unknown air contact? Bra, 270, 48, 28,000 feet, a bogey, over. Charlie Banger, radar pictures clean. The E-2 radar operators have been frustrated in their attempts to get a radar return on the unknown aerial target that Princeton is tracking. Even with their 24-foot radar dish, they can't get a lock on the object. Banger, Charlie, transfer fast eagle flight to Charlie Control, button 1-3. We have a real-world task for them, over. Charlie, Banger, Roger. Kick it fast, Eagle to Charlie Control, button 1-3. Fast Eagle, Charlie, stand by for real-world tasking. Charlie, Fast Eagle, Roger, send it. Contact, Bra, 270, 41, 20,000 feet, low heap, snap, 270, over. As we start tracking out to the west, they're calling, hey, 30 miles, and they're giving us, it's called, it's called a broad bearing range and altitude, so they're saying, hey, contact is 270, 30, 20,000. 100, go trail. 100. Say state. State 12,000 pounds. Clean, do you have it? I'm trying to get a track on it now. They said link 16, but my radar picture is clean. The next radio call takes everyone by surprise. Fast Eagle 110, say loadout. 110, watch your weapons loadout. Wings clean, Princeton. We just have CAD M training missiles and they're not coming off the rail. Now the controllers have the pilots' undivided attention. Normally, the squadron doesn't carry live ordnance when training. What do you guys think that was about? What, about the loadout? 
I have no idea. Maybe it's drug runners or something. Yeah, it could be. Or a lost assassin out of SoCal. I don't like this. That's Eagle Charlie. Contact Bra 16034, 8,000 feet. Move you over. As Fast Eagle approaches the target, they see nothing unusual. Onboard radar show a blank screen. Fast Eagle Charlie Bra 16010, 8,000 feet. Over. Roger. Fast Eagle Charlie, merge plot. Over. When they get to a point where they call merge plot, which means the contact that we're trying to see and us are inside the resolution cell of the radar, which means they can't discern the two of us. They just see one blob. Approach the object appears to be stationary. I had it at 177. Still, we can basically know where to be on. Hey, you guys seeing us? What is that? And I see something in the water, and it looks like about the size of a 737 in the water, pointing east. One zero zero, anchor here, angels two four. Roger. Charlie, fast eagle. We're observing something in the water here, possibly aircraft in the water at the merge plot, just north of our position, about two miles. Charlie, Roger. I'm descending to Angels 14 to take a look. Do you think that's our unknown? Eh, not sure. Radar's clean. As Commander Fravor gets closer to the underwater object, he suddenly spots another craft above it. A much smaller, white object with an oblong shape, hovering and darting just above the waves. So it would be on the right-hand side of the airplane, just forward of the wing line, is this little white, which looks like a tic-tac, which is why we call it the tic-tac, and it's moving around erratically, so it's doing this. Suddenly the object begins to rise into the air. Strange craft begins mirroring the turn rate of Fast Eagle. We're coming down and it starts coming up, so it's going towards nine o'clock. We're going towards three o'clock. And we do this all the way around until I get all the way back towards about the nine o'clock position. Commander Fravor is now about a mile away as he maneuvers his Hornet to get behind the unknown craft. It's about the size of an F-18, so, you know, 40-some feet long. Uh, it has no wings. As the dogfight unfolds, he quickly turns and dives to bring his jet's nose ahead of the object to close the distance. It's past, it's gone beyond the horizon in the blink of an eye. It literally is one minute it's there, and the next minute it's like poof, and it's gone. I saw it go 137, no tally. That didn't just happen. Say again. All right, 
Hope you guys enjoyed that uh, video. Everyone can still hear me in the back? Okay. Um, what I'm going to describe to you very briefly now is the first incident that occurs that allows us to calculate an acceleration value. And that's going to be based on testimony of what the radar show. So let's go back a few days before this event occurs. So prior to November 14th, for several days, the USS Princeton and the USS Nimitz are tracking objects at 80,000 plus feet, and they're moving at only 100 knots, and they're moving due south. And this comes off and on, it's not constant. They'll see them one day, and it's usually a group of eight to 12 to 15. Then they're gone, and they see them the next day. And the, the first thing these guys do is they recalibrate their systems, they check to see if there's any kind of error, uh, they can't find any errors. Uh, I would suspect, or at least if I was them, I would suspect, well, maybe these are high altitude balloons at 80,000 feet, right? Those could move at 100 knots. So they, they don't take any action against them, right? Uh, there's not a lot of action they can take because these things are at 80,000 plus feet. So short of firing a missile at them, uh, you're not going to do anything. So this goes on for a little bit until November 14th. Now here's what's different on November 14th and why this engagement occurs. There's going to be a red-blue exercise. The U.S. Nimitz strike group is going to defend itself against a flight of marine aircraft out of Miramar Air Force Base. Or not Air Force Base, excuse me, Marine Base. Um, so it's a typical red blue exercise. It's going to happen in the afternoon of the 14th. Well, Senior Chief Day sees these objects on radar, except now they suddenly drop into air operating space of 20 to 28,000 feet. Now there's a concern, there's a potential problem. He's concerned about safety. He wrote in his book that he's kept all this time that the time it took on radar as he was watching it for these objects to drop was 0.78 seconds. So at that point in time, he contacts the captain of the USS Princeton. He requests that they have some of the F-18s that are already in the air engage one of these targets. So they engage the closest one. The first guy that engages He's not shown on that video, but it's Lieutenant Colonel Kurth, a Marine, the commander of that Marine squadron. He was the closest to it. So he heads towards the coordinates given to him by the Princeton. As he approaches the coordinates, he receives a call from the Princeton that says for him to break off because they now have two Super Hornets headed towards his target. But since he's in the area, he goes ahead and just kind of looks around. And he state, he sees this same disturbance in the water. He describes the water that day is silky, clear, no movement in the water. So there's less waves than what you saw in the video. Um, and then he breaks off. That's all he sees. Meanwhile, the two super hornets are headed towards there. Now let's jump back to how quick did this object move from 80,000 plus feet to 20 to 26,000. I mentioned to you the statement from Senior Chief Day. I talked to him in January of 2018. Three months later, I talked to a gentleman by the name of Gary uh, Forrest. Forrest. Yeah, if I pronounce his name right. It's hard to spell. Um, Gary was in a different position. He was what's called fire control, and he's in what's called the CEC, and he is responsible for coordination of weapon systems and radar systems. So he's looking at the radar also. So I ask him, uh, after I have him tell me the, his whole story, then I ask, how long did it take for the objects to drop to 20 to 28,000 feet? His response was, how long did it take you to generate that thought? Now that was, to me, less than a second. So we have two independent witnesses who both 
indicate that their radar system said these objects dropped in less than a second. So now I'm going to let Peter go through some of the, excuse me, some of the acceleration calculations. And I'll give you the clicker. And you actually, you can click through mine. I've got one more slide that I've already talked about. Advance the slide if you would, Ted. Thank you. Advanced technology. Is another one again. One more. Yeah. Oh, so another advancement. Or is this it? No. There. Great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Uh, I, I've only been in the SEU about a uh, year and three months, and uh, Robert attracted me because uh, they talked about science, uh, applying science to this. Uh, field, and I've been interested, you know, for a long time, but um, I haven't seen a lot of science applied to it. And um, Robert's done all the, the real hard work of going and investigating, talking to these people, and because so much of this um, uh, incident is so dependent on the quality of the observers on this, because, you know, we don't have, we, we don't have the instruments, we didn't go measure these, these times. We have to depend at the quality of it uh, is accurate. And, and Roger, I mean, um, Robert, through, uh, you know, independent testing, these two independent visual, uh, individuals, gets that the time uh, to go from 20,000 to 80,000 feet, maybe even beyond, is like less than a second. And so using this, uh, I, I, I want to, uh, I mean, it's really important, but uh, before I get into that, I want to talk about the methodology I used in uh, uh, in my analysis uh, of this. And um, we talk about this as a forensic analysis. And what we usually think of forensic analysis is like uh, in a crime case. Uh, but the, it, it's applied in our case because it, you know, even in a crime case, it's something that's happened in the past, you apply scientific methods, you gather evidence, and you try and find out what happened uh, in the incident. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're gonna use the scientific method and uh, also, I, I, I like to invoke what's called the null hypothesis. And I'll, I'll get into what that, what that means. And I'm going to uh, reference the conclusions based on the null hypothesis. And uh, I claim that the best uh, we can do is know what it isn't. We, we don't know what this is, just, just like uh, you know, uh, Dr. Taylor talked about, uh, and, you know, or, or Louis uh, uh, Elizondo. You know, we don't know what these things are. We're not going to try and tell you they're UFOs or anything like that. I mean, um, but what we can say is they're not anything that uh, current technology can produce. They, they might even be some natural phenomena. We don't know, but it's very unlikely. Okay. Uh, the, the methodology for forensic analysis is uh, apply scientific knowledge and analysis to investigate an unknown aerial phenomena, this is what we're doing, to collect and preserve all evidence and determine the true nature of phenomena and provide publicly available reports of the investigation. And we've done that. We have a report that's 270 pages and it will be made public um, you know, pretty in a, in, a, in a near future. Now, what the null hypothesis comes from statistics. And basically, I'm, I'm going to say that it, it, in, when they do a sampling of uh, a statistical sampling, and then they take a sample, they want to find out how much it differs from the population. And it, it, can it be explained as being really different, or is it just part of the population? In our case, uh, we, we would state this as, in our case, the event is not different than uh, usual events and results from misidentification of ordinary phenomena. So uh, the, the, the null hypothesis that I'm going to address is that this was uh, some kind of ordinary airplane, some kind of a drone, something like that, and that we misidentified it. But I'm going to prove that isn't the case. Okay. And, and this is just a flow chart of, uh, of, of what we're doing, the methodology used. And uh, we start with the observation, which was the Nimitz and the interviews. We, and uh, the, the null hypothesis, can this event be explained by ordinary means? We do our analysis of the interviews, we do calculations, we gather uh, research, and 
we find out, you know, if it's true, if, if, if this can be explained by ordinary events, then uh, we dismiss it. You know, this is not uh, anything uh, out of ordinary. If it isn't, it's unexplained and requires further research. And we're, and we're uh, trying to get this whole area uh, treated scientifically and not to be dismissed. Uh, you know, if you go look up what ufology is on the internet, it's considered a pseudoscience. And we're, we're trying to put the science in it, the real science, and, and come up with, uh, you know, a respectable uh, investigation, uh, you know, into this phenomenon, because it's real. Okay, uh, there, there are three reports, uh, reported events that we're going to analyze, uh, or we did analyze in this report, and we're going to cover this, uh, this evening. The first one is uh, what Robert talked about, where the uh, rapid ascent and descent of unknown objects from low altitude, is, it was described... Uh, there were multiple events, and uh, it's described from sea level, 20,000, 28,000, 80,000 feet, uh, reported by the Spy-1 radar, operated by uh, the, the Kevin, uh, Kevin Day, and uh, also corroborated by Gary Boris. The second encounter is the F-18 pilots, which you saw in the video, and um, where you know they encounter this Tic Tac object, and it shoots off into the distance. We're going to talk about, in the actual video, it says it disappeared over the horizon. I'm going to show that that's not the case. Uh, you know, it didn't disappear because it went over the horizon. The third one is uh, the actual video, which, we're gonna, which was uh, an encounter by the, uh, after uh, 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 Fravor got back to the Nimitz, he told the pilots to go uh, investigate these things, and they uh, have an infrared video, which we'll go and cover. Okay, uh, how did I investigate this? I'm going to deal in, in this particular episode with uh, the, the acceleration from uh, 20,000 to 80,000 feet. I took 20,000 feet because um, it's kind of like, uh, was the most, kind of the most common one I ran, we ran into in the descriptions. Now, I put some equations up here, uh, and I, you know, all we have is an average velocity. Uh, 0.78 seconds, it went uh, 60,000 feet in 0.78 seconds. Uh, so uh, what do we do with this? So the first thing I, I, I thought about this, and I, I said, well, I'm going to assume uh, a linear uh, velocity acceleration. From uh, It goes from uh, zero to the uh, halfway point. You've got to understand, it, it, at, at 20,000 feet, it's hovering. So its, it's uh, velocity is, uh, you know, close to zero. At the 80,000 foot point, it's still hovering again. So it had to r uh, rise to a... Um, uh, you know, to, to a high velocity, and then had to start decelerate again to be able to hover at 80,000 feet. So uh, it, the first assumption I did was uh, just a linear acceleration, and the equations there can be uh, calculated. Uh, they're, they're fairly standard, you know, kind of like undergraduate physics, and I, I won't. But uh, it, it has, uh, you know, because... Uh, uh, you, be, be, you know, because it has a linear acceleration, the uh, a linear velocity, rather, the acceleration is constant. But what happens at the halfway point is this abrupt acceleration becomes negative. It's a huge, I, I, I'm trying to, uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, I'm trying to explain this as if we were to do this with uh, ordinary means, like a rocket or, uh, you know, some kind of a, you know, something that uh, we could do today. I, I'm, I'm trying to come up with some kind of explanation like that. So. Uh, I, I saw this and said, well, a human being would be killed, you know, uh, at that abrupt acceleration. I mean, I, I didn't know what the acceleration was at the time. I knew it was large, but I, I didn't, I hadn't calculated it yet. So I, I took a second, I, I took a second approach, and, um, whoops, I went the wrong way. No? Okay. I took a second approach, and I said, well, I'll, con I'll consider a parabolic uh, acceleration. Where it where it um, it starts out at zero and it rises in a parabolic uh, uh, a parabolic velocity curve. At the halfway point, the acceleration is zero. The uh, and the velocity is maximum, and then the the acceleration uh, uh, a negative acceleration increases. But you don't get this incredible uh, abrupt change here. But what it turns out, in order to execute this, is the, is the acceleration at the beginning has to be much higher than it is in the first case. So there's really no advantage in this. And, uh, but I didn't know at the time until I, I worked out the actual calculations. 
and it's a little more difficult to analyze. And uh, so uh, from then on, I just kept using the linear uh, velocity uh, approach. And that has some advantages I'll explain later. Okay. Uh, further, uh, I did some uh, calculations on the power requirement. And this is uh, the equations for uh, basically power, uh, the power exerted can be uh, shown as force times velocity. And we, uh, I do it for two cases. One for the actual tic-tac itself, which I assume, uh, you know, we don't know anything about the tic-tac, but uh, I assumed it weighed a ton. You know, this is a 60-foot object, I think, something like an F-18. That's what it was described. An F-18 unfueled weighs 16 tons. So I'm saying, you know, there's some kind of advanced technology that we don't know about that only weighs one sixteenth of a, uh, you know, of, a, uh, of, an F of an F-18, rather. Sorry, F-18. And so I did a calculation of the Tic Tac's power, maximum power that it would have to, uh, in order to do these trajectories, uh, what, it, what it would have to uh, produce and what the accelerations are. And then I said, well, wh what is it possible for an F-18 to do? And uh, later on, one of the next encounters, I compared the, um, the acceleration of capability of an F-18. And you can get that, that's public knowledge. It's, uh, you know, it's maximum speed and what it weighs, and you can actually figure out from the thrust of the engines what its maximum power capability is. And I'll get into that a little later. So these are the results that, uh, that I got, and they're kind of, I, also, uh, also because I'm trying to invoke the null hypothesis, and that is that this is an ordinary event. Rather than just use 0.6, uh, rather than just use, rather than use just, uh, uh, 0.78 seconds, which it's pretty obvious that that's pretty damn fast. That I tried six seconds as well. Now, maybe you know, six seconds is fast, but you know, you you count, you know, six seconds. It's it might be within the possibility uh, that this is uh, possible with some kind of known technology. I, oh, I didn't know. So what what you get is uh, the first thing I, I mean, the blue in, in in the blue point here. It turns out that the parabolic uh, trajectories actually use less energy than, than all of them. So uh, that's just the way it comes out. Well, what you get is that uh, for the six second case that the, the actual maximum speed is 10,227 miles an hour and that the uh, acceleration is 310.56 Gs. And just in perspective, um, an F-18 can, it starts to come apart at about uh, eight or nine Gs. Uh, certainly, uh, also, uh, I, don't, I don't know if Robert talked about this, but the Nimitz, the area that, and, and that zone when they're having one of these strike groups, they don't allow any airplanes uh, other than the ones that are practicing. It's civil aviation, everything else is kept away. So really the only planes that could have been in that area were F-18s or the E-2 Skyhawk. Hawk, you know, that thing. And certainly that's not the, the thing with a big dish up there is not going to take very many G's before it falls apart. So um, when I calc, when I can, so, uh, sorry about that. Let me go. Okay, back to this. Um, <laughs> so now when I go to uh, the power requirements, the uh, power requirements, it turns out, to, in order to do this, even with a six second trajectory, is 9.75 gigawatts. Now let's put this in perspective. A large power supply, a large power plant, like for a city, that might power like um, 350,000 homes, uh, is about one gigawatt. The energy required here is about 10 of those. And uh, this is equivalent to 2.3 tons of TNT being detonated per second. Uh, nobody noticed this. I mean, nobody reported any kind of, you know, event like this. I mean, obviously. Now let's go to the 0.78 seconds. For 0.78 seconds, the maximum velocity is 78,000 miles per hour. The, uh, the G force is 18,385 Gs. That's a liquefying process. <laughs> you know, uh, in, when a, in relativity theory, when someone falls into a black hole, they call it spaghetti, spaghettification because of the, you know, uh, you know, the gradient of, of, uh, 
of gravity is so great that if, you know, your, your legs are pulled so much more that you turn into spaghetti. This you turn into a liquid. Or you know, probably tomato juice, something like that. You know. uh, the power requirements is a 1.5 kilotons of TNT detonated per second. Let's, um, that's a small <laughs> tactical uh, nuclear weapon. That, that's, you know, a small one, but it's still a ta tactical nuke to do that. So that's the energy requirements for this. So uh, for this first event, uh, in, in, uh, conclu so here's uh, the conclusions are pretty obvious. No human could sustain uh, calculated forces. A 170-pound human, uh, for, this is for the um, six-second trajectory, would weigh 17.6 uh, tons. For the 0.78-second trajectory, he'd weigh 1,041 tons. So that would just, you know, it's obvious. Uh, for the uh, six-second parabolic trajectory, it's equivalent to 2.3 tons of TNT being detonated per second. And as I said earlier, for the 0.78, it's, it's a, a one kiloton uh, tactical nuclear weapon going off each second. So five seconds before that, it was almost as much, and five seconds after that, it was almost as much. So th these are like, um, you know, titanic kinds of power requirements. Uh, the speed at maximum velocity would be equivalent to a meteorite entering the atmosphere from outer space. None of these effects were noticed by the personnel reporting this incident, so one must conclude that this unknown technology was used. I mean, there's something going on here. If this really happened, you know, uh, you can't ignore this. I mean, it's something, we've got to investigate this and find out what's going on, so. I'll turn it over to Robert. Thanks, Peter. Okay, remember when I last talked to you, we had the uh, Lieutenant Colonel of the Marines who had gone in and had seen this white spot down on the water. He broke off because he was told two Super Hornets are coming in. That's going to be our next incident of high acceleration. This incident depends on the testimony of the commander of that squadron and his lieutenant commander. We also have testimony of the other two pilots who were there, but I think it's most critical for these two gentlemen who are Naval uh, Academy graduate, graduates as well as, lot, as lots of uh, flying time. So here we have the Super Hornets. Uh, they're coming in. They're headed due west. You saw uh, Commander Fraber mention that earlier. The planes were diverted from their training exercises while at, while at their cap point. Let me tell you what a cap point is. Um, you have a super car you have a carrier strike group, and your F-18s are to defend that strike group. So four points are chosen, and the only people who know these points are the pilots and people with need to know on the ship. But they're basically four rectangular points where these F-18s operate, and that and they know where those points are. No one else does, other than with the need to know. So they're headed, and they're told this is a real-world situation. So they they know now that this is not a training exercises. As some of the pilots said, as part of their concern. Remember, this is the year 2004. 9/11 had just occurred three years ago. So they don't know what they're being sent into. So they're fairly nervous at this point, especially since they were asked if they had ordnance on board. They're headed due west, and they get to the point where the Princeton tells the F-18s, you've reached merge plot, which means on the radar, the F-18s and the target are both one. Now the F-18s have their radar on, but they do not detect any object, other than the Princeton's told them they're where the object is. They see the same water disturbance that was seen by the Marine Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, they don't know what it is. It looks like uh, either an object has sunk or something's immediately below the water. As they're watching this, 
one of the pilots, I don't recall which one, notices this little white object that they call a tic-tac, and that was a name that the pilots gave it. And they see this little tic-tac just jumping around near this water disturbance. Braber describes it as almost like a ping-pong ball in that there is no slowing as it changes movement directions. It's instant, instantaneous is not a good word, but it's very rapid changes of movement. At this point, Fravor decides he's going to go and investigate what's down there. So Fravor tells his WSO in the back seat, we're headed down. Meanwhile, the other pilot and Lieutenant Commander Slate maintain high cover at 20,000 feet. So they're up here, and Fravor's plane is headed down here. All right, so as they go down, Braver notices this object is about the size of an F-18. He sees no wings. He sees no method of propulsion, yet this object is able to move around rapidly. As he told you, he is he's headed down, and at one point, he notes this as do, as do some of the other pilots in their testimonies, and that is that as he's going down, suddenly this tic-tac points its tip towards him. He believes, you know, it is now recognizing his position, especially since it now begins moving up. And as he points out, he's headed down in a pirouette, and it's on a 360 on the other side of the circle, moving up. He does this about one time when he decides, okay, I'm just going to cut across the circle and intercept the target. So he does that. At the moment he begins to do that, the target makes a quick adjustment and then it takes off at a very rapid speed. This is where we will do the next acceleration calculation. Now, I think at this point, it's important to tell you two things. First, what the pilot said. Fravor makes a very, I would say, crystal clear point about how long this occurs. He says, and he's testified multiple times on this, but in his best testimony, he states that it takes a second, and then he stops and says, have you ever been to an air show? If you watched a jet go over you at Mach 2 and watched how long it takes to disappear over the horizon, it's 10 to 15 seconds. And then he states, this took one second. So it's clear this witness, who's a very intelligent man, is aware that this object just disappeared faster than any jet is capable of disappearing. <coughs> Lieutenant Commander Slade says, and remember, this is important, he has a different perspective, right? So you might say, well, well what if something happened and the sun flashed on it and we couldn't see it? But you've got uh, Fravor, who's engaging it, You've got Slate, who's up here at 20,000 feet. His background's the ocean below Fravor's plane in the unknown. He states the object disappeared as if it was shot out of a gun. I can, would consider that very close to what Fravor is describing. And I just want to show you again, these are two commanders some of the best in the United States Navy. These are the guys that defend us every day. And so what I'm asking you to believe is that their statement is true. If you don't believe their statement is true, then the acceleration calculations that Peter will show you won't make sense, won't matter. But in my mind, I have no doubt that what these guys have stated are true statements. All right, on the, uh, the aftermath of the encounter, and then Peter will go into accelerations. Basically, what happens after this object disappears? That encounter lasted five to seven minutes. The planes return to the side of the water disturbance once the object disappears, and the water's now clear, so that's, that's no longer there. They head back to the USS uh, Nimitz, since 
their objective has been achieved, the object disappears, and they get a very strange statement back as they are beginning to approach the Nimitz. And that is, and that comes from the Princeton. You will not believe this, but the Tic Tac is back at your cap. That means on radar, the USS Princeton has now seen the Tic Tac again, but where is it this time? Is it the F-18's cap point? Who knows where the F-18 cap point is? The pilots and those with the need to know on those ships. So this is a, uh, a very strange uh, incident, and I won't comment on what that means, but you can probably think about it. All right, Peter, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Robert. Um, this little uh, diagram here from our report, uh, it's just a recap of, uh, of, of what uh, we saw here. And um, the, um, uh, you know, the, the two planes are vectored out to where the Whitewater incident down here. And uh, Fravor, uh, just the, the Tic Tac is down here. Fravor descends to try and uh, intercept it. And the uh, Tic Tac shoots off to the cap point. Now, uh, the cap point is um, been described as uh, not exactly how far away it was, 40 to 60 uh, nautical miles. I chose 40 miles, uh, 40 conventional miles, just to be conservative, uh, again, for the null hypothesis. I, I wanted to uh, describe, I, I left out something about talking about the null hypothesis. Uh, in science, uh, a, 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 uh, to be scientific, you have to propose, uh, uh, Dr. Taylor talked about that, you have to propose something, and it has to be testable. Uh, Karl Popper, who was a, uh, a, a, a philosopher of science, uh, said that uh, unless a, um, uh, unless the, a, a proposition or a, a um, hypothesis can be falsified, unless you can test it and experiment against it and either prove it's true or false, it's not scientific. I mean, so, you know, if you say, uh, you know, the red rabbit uh, from the beginning of time created the universe, there's no way you can test that. You know, I mean, uh, what are you going to do about the red rabbit? He's gone, you know, and you're never going to be able to test it. But if you have a hypothesis in our case, that this, uh, the, the null hypothesis in our case, that this was a, a regular airplane or was some, something that we could identify that explains the whole phenomena, if we can prove it can't, you know, possibly have been uh, anything that we know about, <laughs> then we, we have a case that this is actually uh, an unknown event and needs further investigation. went the wrong way here. I have trouble with it. Okay. Um, so uh, we talked about the second encounter uh, here, and uh, I, I define this in the report as, called, uh, as it accelerates away. I call it the blind point distance. And um, as the accelerate, as, as it goes away, there's two, there's two reasons why it might become invisible. One is it went over the horizon, which is stated in the video, and I'll maintain that, uh, show you that that's not right. The other one is visual acuity. And a human can see, um, uh, we can see objects uh, that, uh, from the eye that, uh, that uh, any, anything that's about 1 60th of a degree of angle becomes invisible to, to a, a, someone with perfect vision. That's where the 300 dots per inch comes from in printing. Uh, you can hold a piece of paper up your eye and you can't really see the little, uh, or you might say pixels, that, make the image clear, because they're, they're less than 1 60th of a degree. You, you go real close, you can see it, but at hand, at distance, you know, uh, it, it, it looks perfectly clear. And uh, we also, that uh, these pilots, uh, you know, th these guys have you know, 3,000 hours of, uh, of flying time, of uh, flying F-18s. Uh, I think they know what, uh, uh, looking down a mile, you know, from, the, from an altitude, what, what an F-18 looks like at the water, the size of it. They're pretty good at judging sizes, and they probably have pretty good vision. So uh, they said that uh, this was about 60 feet long. Now, uh, we had to take into uh, account uh, the fact that as this thing rocketed away, it could be at angles. It could be, you know, it could be, uh, aerodynamically, it doesn't seem to matter. It has no lifting surfaces. It, it could just, it could fly off at an angle. It could fly off at 45 degrees, or it could fly off an end. So we did calculations for it uh, for uh, 
uh, 60, 30, and 15 feet. In addition, uh, you know, the, the possibility of visual acuity, uh, we, you know, this was a very bright day, and so, um, you know, it was perfect, you know, perfect vision is 1 60th. So what we did, you know, the physiological study of this is really for PhDs and physiology and stuff. We don't have anybody like that. So what we did was we just backed off and we said, we'll assume uh, that uh, poorer vision, you know, like 1 30th of a degree and 1 15th of a degree. At 1 15th of a degree, this is something like somebody with glaucoma on a foggy day, you know. So uh, this is trying to make it, uh, you know, uh, again, explainable in some way, something to try and show it. And um, I'll, I'll move on now, I guess, so now that I explained that. Oh, oh, wrong way. Okay. So the first thing is, uh, did it move over the horizon? Now, now we know by the, uh, there's a simple, uh, you can look this up on the internet, but uh, you can calculate how far the horizon is uh, based on the altitude. Now, they weren't at sea level when this took place. They're, he was descending, and the Tic Tac was rising, and, and we know that it was you know, three or 4,000 feet at least. And, that what the, the, and the, um, the, the cap point is, I'm, I'm saying 40 miles, it could have been 60 miles, but uh, if you look at this, if you look at this table over here, uh, well, first you can derive this formula which is uh, the uh, distance to the horizon is the square root of two times the altitude times the radius of the Earth. And it holds up fine as long as, uh, you know, your altitude is bigger than zero. You know, it's much larger than zero. It gives a pretty accurate result. Well, it turns out that uh, the distance to the horizon is much farther than the cap point. So you know, you, you know that, uh, like, it shows 100 miles or 94 miles, something like that. So you know it, it didn't disappear because, it, you know, it reached the horizon. Well, I keep screwing up here. Okay. So now we're going to look at the visual acuity. Now this, um, I talked about the 160th of a degree here. And this little, uh, uh, you know, the little uh, diagram here. This is a simple, uh, well, simple for, you know, if you had high school trig or something. You know, it's uh, tangent relationships gives the, if you know the uh, 1 60th of a degree angle of human vision, and you know the approximate size of the object, you can calculate how far away it is. And so uh, we did those calculations for uh, the case of where the object was 60, 30, and 15 feet. And also when this angle was for 1 60th of a degree, 1 30th and 1 15th of a degree. And we made tables, I made tables anyhow. Also, um, how long did it take uh, to go this distance D? Well, uh, we, you know, we don't have the exact timing. Uh, so I assumed uh, 0.2 seconds, 0.5 seconds, 2.5 seconds, and 5 seconds. And like, 5 seconds is not exactly shot from a gun. Uh, 0.2 and 0.5 is. Uh, and so uh, I created basically spreadsheets, and uh, so we had independent variables of time, of uh, visual acuity angle, and also size, and produced a, uh, you know, basically a bunch of tables that allow us to, uh, oh, okay, okay, I wanted to, before I, I got to that table, I wanted to talk about uh, linear velocity. Uh, why, why assume a linear velocity? And, uh, because uh, it's, it's kind of nice and, and it's kind of simple. You always have the average velocity. You know, we know that it went some distance in, in a certain amount of time. And since it, tra it starts from, uh, you know, uh, it's rest, it has constant acceleration, and we can calculate what that is. And uh, also, if it deviates, it, it, it forms kind of a, a, okay, the maximum velocity is twice the average velocity. You can, it comes out of the math. And uh, you can also uh, determine that, uh, if it is faster or slower, uh, it ha in order to have the same average velocity, uh, it sets a boundary here. So if it goes slower, in order to have the same average velocity, it has to have gone faster. So it, it kind of like, you, you, you can kind of say that it had to be, the acceleration had to be at least this. We don't know what it was, but it could have been greater and it could, it could have been briefly for a less, but you know, it, it, it sets up kind of a boundary for it. And so uh, that, that, that's why it's, it's easy to use. And it, it surprised me that it's kind of a, a really, kind of a nice way of doing this thing. 
Um, so I, I see here in five is kind of an envelope. Uh, this minimum energy path, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure of that anymore, so I'm going to pass on that <laughs> right now. Uh, okay. Uh, again, I use the, I'm just going over that. I just use the same uh, equations here. All right. So now I want to talk about um, the uh, first, uh, there, okay, to, to further complicate this thing, uh, at least I, I think I introduced this complication, is we don't know, uh, you know, it said earlier that there were groups of these things, of these tic tacs. They weren't just one of them. At times there were eight of them going up and down. We don't really know, uh, and they have no, they're blobs. I mean, they, they don't, I mean, they're, okay, they're tic tacs, right? Or they're, they're, they're you know, it's, uh, tubular shaped objects. But uh, there's never been reported they look any different. So we really don't know it's the same object. We don't know that the object that showed up at the cap point is the same one that they saw. So I, I took two cases. One where it's a different object. It just took off and went to the blind point and was not seen anymore. And the other one is where it actually went to the cap point, the same one. And so we're going to calculate the calculations for uh, all that. So uh, in this case, the first case is uh, the object shoots away and it's not the same one as the cap point. And it's, it's, it's basically uh, this top, uh, well, this doesn't show up as blue very well, but uh, it, it just shoots off. It uses the first part of the equations. Uh, it's a piecewise linear uh, equation, and it just shoots off, you know, a rise and it disappears. And we're going to calculate the, uh, you know, t the, t the distance and time it takes and the power used uh, in order to do that. The second case is when it's actually the same. And uh, so for the first case, here's case one. And this uh, also, you know, I calculated for 0.2 and up to uh, 2.5 seconds, but I left those out. I just, took, I just took the case for half a second and five seconds, just as, uh, you know, ex kind of a, sort of extremes. Uh, the, the half second comes from uh, physiology. Uh, it's been sort of like tested and stuff that, uh, that it takes uh, about half a second for if you show something an object for it to register in your consciousness. It's about half a second. So I, I, I assume that right around that time is when this thing took off, shot like a gun, half a second. Five seconds, I don't think anyone's going to say that shot from a gun. And I use that because uh, for the null hypothesis, you know, perhaps we have some secret airplane somewhere that in five seconds you could go across the horizon and disappear. I, I don't know, rocket, so something like that. So, uh, and also, I, if you see here, uh, also, I, I, here, these are the angles, seen at angles, 60 feet, 30, 15 feet, and visual acuity, 160th of degree, 130th of degree, 115th of degree. And um, what we get for this, uh, you know, is, uh, whoops, I don't keep going up here. What am I doing here? Uh, down. Okay, that's case. Okay, case two. I'm gonna. Uh, I'll, I'll. I'll summarize it. Well, let me, let me go back for a second here. Okay, this is case. Okay, I want to do that. Case one. Uh, just quickly. Um, these are huge. Uh, you can see the. Uh, you can see here that the. Uh, uh, the, the best case is with uh, best visual acuity. The angle is 60 degrees and half a second. It, 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 the blind point is, is almost at the cap point, 39 miles. The uh, acceleration is incredible. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, 51,000 Gs. And uh, this is, again, equivalent to uh, another nuclear weapon here. The worst is the guy with glaucoma and, and a foggy day. That's down here. Uh, here, the... Um, the acceleration is 32 Gs. You say, well, 32 Gs, you know, that's not much, you know. Uh, that would, uh, there's a, there was a guy uh, back in the 1960s where they were trying to test uh, what human capability was for acceleration. They'd use a rocket sled. And there was this guy, uh, I've forgotten his name, I had it written down, but I'm not going to, but he was a doctor within the uh, uh, military and he kept, uh, he, he kept, for some reason, he kept taking these tests on rocket sleds. And uh, he got up to 28 G, 38 Gs, actually he got up to 38 Gs. But he broke wrists, he broke his, uh, he broke his uh, ribs, 
his uh, retinas were bleeding, and uh, he lost fillings from his teeth. And he kept doing it. They had to stop him. His his uh, his office. He kept wanting to do it. And and those those uh, uh, those measurements they took are still used today for like uh, cars for crash accidents and everything. I mean, he he really did fulfill you know an important need to, to get this information. But uh, you know, strange guy. I mean, he was willing to go blind or something to you know go ahead and do this. So uh, okay. The second case is where it is the same object going to the cap point. And that's this uh, bottom here where it, it accelerates and, and it comes to a maximum velocity and then uh, the, uh, the, you know, the rocket or whatever reverses its thrust and it starts decreasing until it rests at the cap point or at different, different points. Now, it, it doesn't always go to the cap point because it depends on the uh, visual acuity, how far away you get and then the conditions for visual, uh, you know, how well it is. I mean, if you're not, if you don't have perfect vision or if the thing is at an angle or something, it's going to be less than that. You, you know, it's going to disappear before it gets to the cap point. And uh, so all that's taken care of in the table. And uh, let's see, okay. Oh, okay. So this is the second uh, table here, case two. And um, it, it again, uh, you know, it, 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 it's in this case the G's are uh, 83,500 G's, and again another nuclear weapon. And then on the glaucoma case, it's still 32 G's. That just comes out of the math. But the uh, tons of TNT, it's still 610 tons of TNT being detonated uh, each second. 610 tons of TNT is noticeable. I notice it anyhow. Nobody noticed any of this. Okay, this is to summarize it in, in this table here. Uh, I have the uh, the maximum minimum case. So uh, for the half second and perfect uh, vision, you have eighty three thousand G's. Uh, this is equivalent. The power to do this for a, a one ton tic tac is a one point seven one times ten to the fifth gigawatts. That's uh, 10,000, well, it's actually 20,000 power plants to do this. 20,000, like, large power plants in order to have this kind of capability. This is equivalent to a 40 kiloton nuclear weapon. The, uh, I think the one that they dropped on uh, Hiroshima was about 17 kilotons. That's, uh, that's per second to do this. Clearly, something is strange going on here. Nobody reported any of this. And the minimum uh, is uh, still, uh, the minimum is 32 Gs, and uh, it's 1.29 gigawatts, so that's still one power plant. This is just for five seconds at, um, and the cap, the bind point is only 2.44 miles, and the parent divide diameter is 15. It still takes 32 Gs, and it, it still takes a, a, the power of a power plant to do this, a large a power plant. And it's still 610 uh, pounds of TNT being detonated per second. So the conclusions. Uh, oops. Okay. Here are the conclusions. The blind point distance was determined to be due to visual acuity and not due to the horizon. Uh, looking at acceleration in all cases, it would be intolerable for a human pilot. How can we say this uh, can be? Uh, you know, how could this be an ordinary object? No human could survive this. Even in, the, even in the best case, it, it's beyond human capability. Uh, in the most likely cases, any mechanically complicated device would disintegrate. I mean, I think uh, some of these uh, smart shells uh, that can, can handle a couple of hundred Gs. You know, they fire. Some of these new uh, artillery shells have a GPS guidance and stuff in them, you know. But it's very difficult to keep electronics uh, that doesn't you know, get destroyed at, you know, a few hundred Gs, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty terrible, it's pretty hard to make something like that. This is thousands of Gs. Uh, and, the, you know, the power dissipated, what you have to understand from, ther you know, thermodynamics is that if, if you have a, um, the, the energy has to go somewhere. I mean, if, if you have a, um, uh, all of our current technology uses uh, reactive, uh, you know, jet engines, rocket engines, Automobiles all use uh, a um, reactive type of power, uh, meaning that 
use an explosion to uh, basically power the device. A rocket engine explodes inside the actual uh, chamber of a rocket and it comes out the back. That energy is released to the atmosphere. So uh, this, this energy would have been released to the atmosphere and, and show up at, like when a meteorite comes in or something like that. You know, This would be very noticeable and uh, destructive. So the only component, okay, now one, one other thing I want to talk about. I'm completely ignoring, I, I'm talking strictly about the horizontal velocity. I didn't, this thing rose too, it had to rise to 80,000 feet. The first case I talked about, the power of that, that still has to happen in the same amount of time. So you have to add that to this, but uh, you know, th this I'm just assuming uh, a minimum of 40 miles, and uh, uh, just going horizontally. So you have two components of power that have to be taken into consideration. It's just mind-boggling. Uh, so the, you know, the null hypothesis that this event is explained by known objects that were uh, misidentified can't be substantiated. I mean, wh what is this thing? I mean, and, and, you know, the objects remain of unknown origin and technology. So I turn it over to Robert. Thanks, Peter. All right, this is now our uh, third case in this event where we can, can calculate uh, acceleration numbers. I remember when I last talked to you, the jet's headed back to the USS Nimitz. Well, when Fraker arrives on the Nimitz, He's the commander of the squadron, so he tells the next guys that are going to be taking off, who happen to have a Raytheon float uh, pod on their jet. If you see this thing, I want you to get video of it. So, the, so I, a flight takes off at around 3 o'clock, and these guys actually detect a target 33 miles to the south. And when you see Peter's next presentation, you'll see that that distance roughly falls into the tables he will create uh, in terms of distance. There's several single target track locks attempted on the object without success, but they do take the IR video and then they return to the Nimitz. That video is widely, as I told you earlier, it's circulated all over the Nimitz and all over the Princeton. This is the video was on a classified military email site. So, but they share it with each other. So it's like everyone's watching it. And actually when Frager gets back to the Nimitz, they're playing the X-Files and all sorts of stuff. You might ask, why are they doing that? I mean, he is the commander of a squadron. Well, they already know what has happened before he gets to, back to the Nimitz. Because in the modern era, as he was engaging this object, it's being broadcast to the to what's called the CIC, or the center core of the Princeton and the center core of the Nimitz. So everyone on the Nimitz already knows what's happening to Fravor and to Slate. So that's why when they get back, they get to hear the X-Files and all that, because the, his compatriots are already aware of it. And actually, Fraker takes it pretty well. He, uh, except he, he doesn't take one thing well. An intelligence officer tells him, oh, the Navy's very concerned about that, and they're going to have a big investigation, which Fraker kind of wanted. But then when he finds out that the guy was pulling a leg, his leg, as he said, that intelligence officer and I had a little talk he did not appreciate that. All right, now we're going to play, uh, this is less than a minute. It's a quick video, and you'll see this is um, the IR video that was taken by the, the next crew that went out. And I'll press this, and let's see if it plays. Switching back and switching back and forth between IR and right now they're in TV mode.
in a moment you'll see him go back to IR. So he's back to IR. Now watch. He almost loses lock. He's increased magnification twice. And he lost lock. I talked to a, uh, a Canadian officer in the Air Force who used this exact AtFLIR system made by Raytheon. Uh, their Air Force, he actually used it on the ground and they used it to photograph missile launches. I asked him if he ever saw an object that, or his system lose lock like that. And he, and because when he's filming a missile, that missile's accelerating at multiple G's, but the target is staying right in the middle of the screen. It's not moving off of the lock. He indicated that he only one time ever saw a lock broken, and that's when he was driving in a Jeep and they had a huge pothole and he lost lock. But other than that, he did not lose lock. And if you think about it, it's difficult to lose lock because these guys are in combat situations and you have another jet locked onto your system, but when you turn your jet suddenly, you can't suddenly lose lock because you're in a military combat situation. So these systems are designed to maintain lock on any target that's there. All right, so the next thing I just wanted to talk about briefly is just the provenance of that video. Uh, it was released by the New York Times and uh, TTSA in December of 2017 uh, it's stated to be out of the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, there was also a copy uh, that we obtained. Uh, it was actually leaked in 2007 on a website called Above Top Secret. So one of the first things we did early on in this investigation was to verify that the video was real. So what we looked at is we broke the video down frame by frame and we compared all the different versions of the video. And the one that was leaked in 2007 is the same video that was released by the Department of Defense. Um, the other thing we did, and this was the most important, is that the key witnesses who saw the video on the ship looked at this video and in all four cases, Commander Fraber, Lieutenant Commander Slate, Senior Chief Day, Petty, Off Petty Officer Burris, and another guy I talked to, Petty Officer Turner, have all told me that the video was the exact same video that they saw, except for a difference. It was low, this video is of lower quality, and it is not nearly as long as the original video. When I asked Lieutenant Commander Slate why that would be, he gave me a very good explanation, which made sense once I understood what he said. He said, when you're going into a situation and you're going to turn on video, you do not wait until you get into that situation to turn on your video. It's basically, you leave the carrier with the video on. So normally their video is going to be on from when they leave the carrier until they return to the carrier. So what you're looking at is a portion the full video. All right, now I'm going to let Peter uh, explain to you basically how he calculated the acceleration that you saw towards the back end of the video. I want to make one comment. Um, Larry, there's another portion of the video and Larry Kate's done some work on it. You couldn't see it there, but there are two frames where you where the object, or four frames, Larry says four, four frames where the object basically moves like this across the video. Because there's so few frames, we don't know for certain that that couldn't be an artifact of the system itself. The only way we will ever know that for certain is if we could get Raytheon engineers to discuss with us 
you know, the intricacies of this system and whether or not that could be a failure within the system versus an actual object doing that. But if that was true, then you're probably looking at, again, tens of thousands of G's of acceleration. So I'll turn it over to uh, Peter now. Thanks, uh, Robert. Uh, good background for. I wanted to. Uh, I want to look at my notes here because I wanted to point out certain things about this. Um, this is uh, okay. You know, you know. This is the. Uh, I'm going to call this thing. Um, you know, this is the flare pod that it took, and this mounts under the F-18, and uh, it's an AN ASQ 228 Advanced Targeting Forward Looking Infrared AT Flare. I'm just going to call it the flare camera. Or, the flare, and I. Uh, this is the um, display that the. Um, I, it's kind of small here, but I'll point out, uh, you know, a few items here. Um, uh, you know, on the left, uh, you know, okay, I give you the name, uh, and um, uh, you know, of a, a, a particular interest, uh, you know, on this is a uh, the horizontal. Uh, you know, uh, I'm uh, okay. Um, I only looked at the last, about the last uh, few seconds of the video when it moves across the screen because uh, that to me was the most interesting. Uh, the reason being um, that it's clear, uh, the, it had the minimum amount of changes during the video. I mean, they, they weren't, uh, there were some changes going on during the video, but they weren't switching between uh, the, uh, you know, uh, normal video and IR and all this stuff that makes it really hard to calculate. Plus, uh, the interesting thing is, what did that object do when it moved to the left? How fast was it moving? And um, so, uh, a couple of interesting things here uh, I'll point out is uh, these, uh, at the top here and over here, is the angle, uh, this is the angle that the uh, camera is pointing relative to the ground, relative to the ground, of, uh, the plane's flying along, and it, it you know, it, it's relative to, to the, uh, it, it, okay. If it's positive, which these are, it means it's, it's pointing slightly up from the axis of the airplane relative to the ground. And I guess, well, I guess you could say relative to the airplane, but the airplane is relative to the ground. The uh, next thing uh, here is that um, over here is this thing called, uh, it's kind of hard to see here, but I think you'll see in the video, it says NAR. That means the narrow field of view. And we talked about uh, you know the field of view in those triangular uh, calculations, the, the trigonometric calculations. Um, in this case, the camera's field of view is 0.7 degrees under this case. Um, so uh, this this object is like looking uh, 0.7 degrees. I, I, I'm kind of an amateur photographer. 0.7 degrees is a telescopic kind of uh, uh, field of view. Uh, this would be like a telescope with 40, 60 power or something like that. But it's like looking through a soda straw because you're looking at a tiny little part of the sky and I'll, sh I'll show that later. But uh, it's very important that we know that, uh, you know, that, that angle for, cal for the calculations. And we've gone through the uh, different specifications and we're pretty sure it's 0 .7, 0 0.7 degrees. Um, next is uh, down at the bottom here is the speed that the plane is moving. It's 0.55 Mach, uh, Mach 0.55, I don't know, 400 miles per hour or something like that. Uh, you know, I, I off the top of my head, I don't know exactly what that is. Also that the, um, let's see, what else? Uh, the white setting on the flare, it means that the, uh, the hotter part of the object is shown as white and that the colder, like the, um, you know, the atmosphere and the uh, world outside is, is dark. Is dark, and um, so I think that's all the things that I wanted to do. Oh, uh, one other thing is the uh, magnification. This thing called zoom. It's probably hard to see here, but you'll see it. I, I have a, a, a slowed down version of the video. It's uh, shown as 1.0 in this particular thing, but it changes from one to two, and so it doubles in uh, in uh, magnification. So what that means is that the uh, Distance is halved when that happens. You're looking at uh, only half the distance when it goes to 2x, and that becomes important in the calculations uh, going forward. But it doesn't make it any easier for us to do this. Uh, okay. All right, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you, you've kind of seen this before, but um, 
and I'm no, in no way am I an expert on flare cameras or anything, but I did the best I could uh, through, through some research. And uh, there's two images up here. One is the F-35 and the other one is the B-2 bomber. Both are stealth objects. But it's pretty clear that although they're stealth and radar and infrared, they're pretty obvious that they're not stealthy at all. And uh, there's a lot of movement going on nowadays to you know, use infrared uh, you know, to detect items. But because you're generally looking through like a soda straw, you usually need radar to find the object first before you can really look at it. So uh, it's interesting that um, you look at this. Here's, here's the B-2 bomber, right, stealth bomber. But you can clearly see, at uh, the distance, you can see the two hot points of the engines. And you can clearly see the outline of the body. Here's a much more close-up. You can clearly see what, the, what it looks like. Here's an F-35. That's another stealth aircraft. And you can, you can see the airframe. You can see the, t the tail. You can see the jet coming out of the back. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, pretty obvious that these uh, objects uh, in infrared are going to be visible. And um, they're not amorphous blobs. If you look at the Tic Tac, it's, it's a blob. I mean, it's just a fuzzy ball, you know, float, uh, you know flying along. It doesn't have any uh, aerodynamic surfaces, no lift, no obvious way it could be, uh, it uses lift, no sense of propulsion, there's no obvious reactive engine using to, to you know, accelerate it or anything. And, uh, you know, what is it? We don't know. Um, Okay, this is a sort of a demonstration again. This is a normal field of human, vis human vision is about 120 degrees. When you, generally, this is, that's where a 50 millimeter lens comes from, kind of common in camera. It's kind of, the, you know, kind of what you see. Uh, the, um, and, and there's the, uh, there's the, supposedly the pilot here. This is the flare video. It's looking at a tiny little angle here of the total vision. Over here, the airplane, we, we have the same trigonometric relationship here. In, the, in this case, the angle is the flare camera, 0.7 degrees. And, w you know, we don't know what the tic-tac diameter is, and we don't know how far away it is, but we can make tables. Uh, created tables for different diameters, and we, we know that it was described as a F, an F-18, which is about 58 feet, something like that. So we, we, we kind of like made tables for different distances and for the, uh, uh, you know, 0.7 degrees, and then for different diameters, and you know, see what, what the accelerations were. Okay, now this is uh, how the calculation, uh, I did the calculation. This is a highly simplified uh, approach I took. I, I tried to take something simple, but, you know, it would be obvious. Um, so uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to show here is, uh, on the left is, uh, you can, this can either be the human eye of the pilot looking at the display on the screen, or it can be the camera's uh, sensor. Either way you want to look at it. Uh, you know, and here's 0 0.7 degrees, and it's, it's looking out at some unknown distance here, and it's some unknown distance uh, away, and the object is uh, some unknown diameter. And so all these are variables. So, uh, it, what I did was arbitrarily, I arbitrarily divided the, um, the image into 12 divisions, and they're called reticles. Uh, uh, reticles aren't just the crosshairs, but they're any kind of a division on these kind of screens. And uh, so I, I tw why didn't I pick 12, uh, which is sort of convenient, I guess I'm used to clocks or something, you know, uh, you know but 12 seemed to work out fine. And um, what I, what the uh, object takes up a certain number of uh, reticles on the screen. I, I did real simple here in this calculation. I just assume it takes two, uh, two reticles. Uh, in the actual analysis, uh, it's fractional. It's a portion of, uh, of a reticle. And, but just for this to show how we did it, I just said it's two because it's easy. Well, two, uh, and, and at distance here, I'm gonna, uh, D2 is going to be assumed to be, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, we're going to calculate what, what that is. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is assume it's at, at 100,000 feet. That's about 20 miles, something like that. So what do we get? So if we assume the distance D1 is 100,000 feet, the object is, it takes up two reticles on the screen. The object is, uh, is the, object of di the object diameter is about 200 feet uh, and travels six reticles. I mean, that, that comes from the trigonometric calculation uh, because 
two reticles uses one twelfth of 0.7 degrees, taking up the screen here. And when you do the calculation, the, it, it, it comes out to uh, uh, 0.058 degrees. And we have this uh, D, D2 is two times D1 times the tangent of uh, 0.058 degrees. And it comes out to be 200 feet. So we know that at, at, at 100,000 feet, th this is uh, 200 feet. So uh, the object moves off the screen. It moves six. It, it moves six reticles, and each reticle represents 100 feet uh, of distance. And so uh, we can do a calculation with that using again. I'm, I'm using the linear velocity uh, because it's. And it turns out that, uh, and it takes. Okay, how, how do we know how long it took? Uh, the uh, video is. Uh, it's about a second, the proportion that I took, and it's 30 frames per second. So you can calculate. Uh, from the be beginning of the video, uh, the frame number, and you can actually figure it takes about one second for it to go off the screen. So uh, what that comes out to is that the object in this particular case, this is not what really happened, but just as an example, in this particular case, it was traveling at 409 miles per hour. The maximum velocity was twice that, 818 miles per hour, and it was traveling 18.6 Gs. So this is, this is the technique uh, I used for creating all these tables. Uh, now, uh, you know, life isn't easy. <laughs> um, in the middle, as it goes off the screen, uh, what happens is, uh, for some reason, they switch from 1x to 2x. And so what happens is the value of the reticle is halved when that happens. It means if you're looking at twice the distance, the, the, the distance of a reticle is no longer uh, the same as it was when it was at 1x. So you have to take that into effect. And... Uh, Oh, what, I, what I did in the calculations, I, I call it the 1x zoom change, uh, the early 1x zoom change, and the late 1x zoom change. What, um, what I, I, here's superimposed, I uh, superimposed two of the images. Here's, here it is at, 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 here it is at uh, 1x, here it is at 2x. It's about twice the size, so it's pretty, uh, that means that during this portion, these, these red, the distance of a reticle calculated by that same trigonometric relationship is only half the distance. So um, the question is, uh, what happens, in, uh, to further complicate it, um, even though it doubles in size, the stupid screen stays 1x. And it's only like, a, it's only like a, you know, a, a short time after that it goes to 2x. So what do you do in that situation? To be conservative, what I did is I, I assumed that um, two cases. One, that as soon as it doubled in size, uh, the uh, distance was halved. In the other case, I, I, I assume that it stays in, uh, this is very conservative, and I, I don't really believe this, but I, I did it anyhow just to uh, prove it, that uh, when, it do, when it, I wait until the zoom actually shows it on the screen, it's 2x, and during that whole time, it stayed uh, in the previous thing that the, I, didn't, I didn't have the distance. So you get a different result in each case, and uh, we we'll created tables uh, to take that into account. These are the actual frame numbers where early and late zoom in. This is in our report, how we calculated it. In this case, for the early zoom, at 0.367 seconds is when it changes. The late zoom is 0.468 seconds. And, you know, interesting, but not that interesting, anyhow. Uh, okay. Now, I, I, what I did was, uh, for this particular case, I slowed the video down to one frame per second. And I'll point out a few things that... Uh, uh, happened during this uh, time, you kind of can see what I'm talking about. Uh, so let me go, boom. Okay, here we go. This is one frame per second. Maybe a little hard to see here. You see this stays as one, uh, it stays as zoom as one. This is the NAR up here. One, and doubled, it's still one. And then finally it goes to two, and then goes off the screen. The other interesting thing is that during this, uh, I want to play this again. Um, <clears throat> oops. You got to go back again. Yeah. Now it's doing yeah, it. okay. Now go forward. There you go. Okay. During this time, if you look up here, these two angles, the angle with respect to the horizon, doesn't change through the whole thing. Uh, one of the debunkers, some of the debunkers, and I have to say that. 
this is probably the most um, uh, respected debunk that I, I've run into, is that the, the reason this went off the screen is that the plane veered left, uh, veered right rather. And so because you're like looking through a telescope, if you ever try to hold a telescope, hold it steady, it, you know, things are moving like this, you have to put on a tripod. Uh, and uh, it, the, the idea being that the object didn't really move, it's just the plane uh, moved for, for two reasons. One, the plane, it's a small plane, it's 60 feet, but I mean, it's, it's traveling along at four or 500 knots. It's gonna be vibrating. And it probably vibrates, uh, you know, a, a few tenths of a degree anyhow. Maybe, maybe the whole amount. And so uh, I, I thought, well, you know, maybe that's a, a good explanation for how this happened. The whole thing is a bunch of baloney, you know. But if that were happening, the flare video would be useless. I mean, it would be constantly losing, losing lock, you know, uh, all the time because, you know, it's constantly vibrating, or at least, you know, you can't have that and be useful. And uh, uh, we know there's a servo mechanism. You can actually see it uh, operating there that tracks it, you know, and keeps it in pretty good lock until the acceleration becomes enough that it can't hold it and it loses lock. You don't want to have a servo mechanism that, um, uh, it, it's called underdamped or overdamped. If it's overdamped, uh, it, it won't track, or it won't lock very well. If it's underdamped, it can oscillate. And so you want to have it what's called critical damp. And then that's when it's you know, kind of the best. It just locks in and stays locked, but when it gets beyond some uh, measurable amount, it will then lose lock. And um, the second case is the plane veered off to the right. Now, when a plane veers off to the right, it usually tips its wings. I mean, it, it doesn't usually just go like this. It, you, if you see they bank and turn off the right. If that happened, those, uh, I believe those angles would change up there on the screen. You'd see that they wouldn't have stayed, re uh, remained the same. Now, I could, be, I could be wrong about this, you know, and of course, we're open to uh, uh, good explanations on this. You know, there are people that know about this uh, could, you know, contribute to this by, you know, letting us know if this is still a valid argument. But I think it's valid, and uh, that's what I went ahead with. So uh, this is just another, I've kind of explained this. This shows the, uh, uh, what I had to do, uh, okay, there's still even more complication. That is, the, if you look at the object, um, it's fuzzy, right? It, it, it has a, we don't know what the diameter is. It's got this kind of corona around it, which we showed in the, in the video, et cetera. So there's kind of a dense center, and in the actual video, I assume that the dense center is about a third of a division, a third of a reticle, and that the corona is about a half of, of, of a division. And I use those just like I did in that calculation I showed you in creating these tables. And uh, so I, there, there's a bunch of different parameters. Uh, I had to take into account the 1x, 2x, the, uh, the, the uh, different diameters, and uh, when it occurred, early and late zoom. Uh, I, and I'm bending over backwards trying to, uh, you know, be conservative about this thing and not just uh, shoot off and, you know, make some assumption about how, you know, uh, yeah, it's a UFO, you know, something like that. I, I'm not into that kind of stuff. So, okay, so, whoop, all right. So now, uh, this is a, um, I had to create some variables. I they call it parameterization of the equations that I talked about before. These. Same old, uh, same old, same old, but there's two, uh, there's two portions of this. There's the early zoom and the late zoom, and then an average that I did. And I won't go into this. Uh, you can read the report and see the uh, variables that I put in there to handle this. But all these do is, uh, is allow you to do all these variations on, basically on the uh, size of the object, the zoom, uh, and the, whether it's the inner dense or the corona, and you know, all these things were taken into account. And, uh, Okay, so here's this very dense table, and here's the parameterized equations. Okay, here's the parameterized equations, which I won't. It's really just the same equations, but I have these different variables in there to take that into account. And basically, you know, I don't have a lot of. We don't have a lot of resources. I just use spreadsheets. You know, it's a little. You know, you didn't write programs or anything like that. Uh, what you get out of this, if you have the, uh, this is the. Uh, early zoom case, just the early zoom case. And uh, so what you get for accelerations in the early zoom for uh, the 1x and 2x, you get about, uh, you know, 60, between 66 and 81 g's acceleration. And uh, I've heard I talked about calculating the power. Um, I'll just talk about the ratio of power. The, 
the uh, power ratio on the side is the ratio of the power that is exhibited by the uh, by a one ton tic tac moving to the left at the velocities calculated, and the power that an F eighteen has if it uses all of its energy engines uh, full power it has. It only has like five percent of the energy to be able to do this. It would have to you know it, it would have to use all of its it wouldn't even, it only have one twentieth of what it takes to execute this maneuver. So it can't be, have been an F-18. The same thing for the late zoom, same thing. At, at, at late zoom, because it stays, um, uh, you, you know, in, in the late zoom, anyhow, I, I don't want to belabor this too much, but uh, again, the, the Gs are um, 43 Gs, and I talked about, you know, G capability and how a human could never survive that. And, it, and the F-18 only has like, a, it, at best, 11% of, of what it takes to do that. In the, um, the second table is the uh, late zoom. And, and again, um, the late zoom, if you look at it, um, the uh, accelerations are a lot higher. And that's because it stays uh, in the calculations. The distance remains, um, it's not halved till much, till, you know, a few, few tenths of a second later. So it actually goes faster, in, 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 and I think it's unrealistic. I think the early zoom is actually what we should use. But I did it uh, kind of as a, um, what do you want to say, devil's advocate or something like that. In, in, in that case, the object, uh, the F-18 only has about one or 2% of the power, maybe down here, 4% of the power to do the, to do the maneuvers that, that we saw. Uh, the average, I won't belabor this, the average is just kind of taking, uh, you know, even, even taking the average of those things, which uh, grossly reduces the capability, you know, of what it could do, it's still 37 Gs or, you know, it's still too high for any kind of an object. And I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know, I think I get carried away on this averaging stuff, but you know, whatever, anyhow. Uh, so these are the conclusions, uh, and I'll, I'll go through them. Tic Tacs are not any aircraft of any known type and exhibit technology. Because what was in the area, the only thing that was in the area was an F-18 and an E-2. You know, that big plane with, you know. So that's not that, E-2 certainly, you know, give it a couple of Gs and probably that pan on top would fly off, you know. Um, the, uh, you know, it's beyond any kind of capability that existed in 2004 or that exists today. I mean, you can take the best planes today and probably couldn't. You couldn't exhibit those kind of Gs. Uh, tic, second, Tic Tacs exhibit at least one of the following characteristics. No aerodynamic airframe, no obvious means of reactive propulsion, acceleration characteristics beyond human endurance, and airframe structural capability. I think I read that the recommended uh, uh, loading, G loading of an F-18 is about eight Gs. I mean, it can take higher than that, but you know, it's not recommended. Uh, okay, I, I gave a lot of, um, credit to this third one about the apparent movement to the left is due to the vibration or I mentioned that. I don't think this is valid, but um, you know, I, I do take it serious as a serious, it's the best counter argument to this video that I, I've seen, anyhow. Most of the other ones are silly, you know, when you really analyze it, they're, 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 the debunkers really haven't done any homework. Here's the other thing, if a Tic Tac were a missile, it, it would be, because you can see the airframe, or at least, let's say it was at such a far distance, you really couldn't see the airframe, but if it were a missile, as it turned left, it would have to get longer. It would have to change shape. But we don't see any of that. It doesn't change shape. It just stays a blob and moves left. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that's a powerful argument against uh, it being any kind of an object with an airframe. Uh, if, a tip, if a Tic Tac were a missile or an airplane, as it moved left, it would, it would have to show part of its long airframe changing the diameter of the image on the flare display as it moved left, and this doesn't happen. If the Tic Tac were an F-18 size aircraft, it would be between 18 and 33 miles from the flare camera. That comes from the calculations in the tables. That's assuming that it, it, it's about 58 feet. We did calculations all the way down to, uh, I mean, you can read in the report, like 15, 10 feet for the size of the object. What happens then is the object's much closer. And because the telescopic capability of, of that camera, you'd obviously see what it is. I mean, you'd, you'd see a missile. You'd see, you know, it, it's, it's a telescope. Um, the next thing is uh, 
Tic Tacs demonstrate acceleration beyond 40 Gs and likely much higher with no noticeable effect on their structure or performance. We're using the early zoom figures from the table as the most conservative. Eight, uh, the flare is capable of registering the maximum dimensions of, a, of an air, airframe showing the aerodynamic structures that support lift and maneuver functions and none are observed. Um, and I've also shown that the F-18 does not have adequate power to exhibit the required acceleration for the maneuvers in the videos. So um, it remains unknown. I, I think that, in my opinion, uh, debunks the um, null hypothesis, that this is just an ordinary object that's misidentified. Oops, long way. OK. Um, and I'll turn this again over to uh, Robert. All right, we're near the conclusion. Okay, this, this is just a quick statement that I think it's important to know, and that's data limitations uh, in our report, as well as data opportunities. Uh, there are three instances where data appears to be lost. Uh, one is Commander Fraber um, made two copies of the video that his guys made right after he flew, when they went out later. He put those tapes in a common locker with his name on them, and within a day or two, those tapes were gone. Now, Fraber's explanation is pretty reasonable. You know, they've got a limited source of tapes, maybe someone grabbed it and used it because they needed it. However, the next two items, Make one wonder if that's what happened to Fraber's tapes. The senior chief, the very next morning after this event, went to write his after-action report. So to make his after-action report, he went to the CIC, the main part of the ship, to get the communication logs. All of the communication logs were deleted. He thought that was, he didn't even, did not even think that could be done. These logs are critical because, let's say, the ship hit, hit a trawler. Uh, you have to have these logs in order to establish what happened. The third instance came from Petty Officer Boris. He was in charge of the Aegis computer system. He told me that within 24 hours of the event, that night, a helicopter lands on the USS Princeton and two non-uniform personnel come to him and request all of the tapes. He, will, of course, uh, they won't give their identity, and he won't comply until the captain authorizes it, and, of course, the captain gives him authorization. So Petty Officer Burris deletes all the information on the ship and then turns over the tapes to these gentlemen. So that's a data limitation for us. However, the important part is that we've got an excellent data opportunity. If we could have those tapes, the radar systems across this carrier strike group are anywhere from 800 megahertz to 12 gigahertz. So there's a lot of valuable information. I believe that if, if we had access to that, we would know the exact size of the object, the exact acceleration capabilities, the exact ability for directional movement change, and possibly even the material, because we have these various uh, frequencies of radar information and other frequencies. So this is my little uh, Las Vegas probability calculation. I gave you three cases where we have acceleration, and Peter established that they're beyond uh, any type of acceleration we can do. So the question becomes, okay, can we explain this away? Um, so let's say somehow Senior Chief Day and Boris made a mistake. The, their memory has gone bad. It, these objects didn't move in a second. So you give that a probability. Let's say there's a 10% chance that's what happened with them. So if that was all we had, then I would say, well, pretty interesting, but can't really do a lot with that. But then let's, let's say now, let's look at the next incident where the two pilots, experienced pilots, tell you an object disappeared in less than a second. How did that happen? Can we explain that away? What's the odds that they made that error? Give that a 10% chance. 
think over the final case, the video, and let's say maybe it's a fake video, so you give that a 10% chance. So what are the odds that there was a, not a single event that day that was beyond normal acceleration abilities of anything we can manufacture? It's the, the multiplicative of all that, or it's 99.9% .9 likely that this happened. At least one incident, at the very least. So now in summary of the incident itself, and Peter's going to give you kind of a more overview summary. Um, think back on, on what we know. We have multiple radar systems from a U.S. carrier strike group identify an exact latitude-longitude coordinate. So you've got multiple radars that tell you here is where something is. You send two different sets of jets. So three jets go to this target location and they visually confirm what the radar indicated. Not only that, but you have two very experienced pilots who confirm that this object's capabilities are anomalous in terms of its ability to accelerate. The radar told us that, and the pilots have told us that. The radar gave the location, the pilots confirmed the location. I think this is a strong argument that this actually occurred, and I think if we could get all the data, we could learn a lot more about this particular event. And so now, Peter, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Robert. Um, I wanted to just, uh, mine's a little bit speculative. And, uh, there's, you know, uh, when you encounter something like this, an event like this, uh, you know, why should we care about any of this, you know? Uh, what came to my mind was in, in uh, listening to some of the interviews that Robert did, uh, one of the fellows was uh, quite concerned about this. You know, it, it, we talk about this that there's kind of a PTSD effect that people who see these things, you know, it kind of really rocks their world. And he was home explaining to his wife, you know, uh, you know about what happened there. And she said, "Well, you know, what does it matter if they don't, as long as they don't land? Oh, you know, what do you want for dinner? You know, and you know, uh, is it important as what's for dinner? Well, you know." Um, uh, how many people know who Stanislav Petrov is? Anybody know? There's one hand back there, and two, three, okay, great. Um, Stanislav Petrov is probably uh, the reason that we're able to have dinner here tonight. Um, and we're not sitting around a campfire roasting rats to try and survive. He was, uh, I think it was 19, um, I don't have it in front of me here. I think it was like 1986. He was a, um, um, in charge of the Russian missile uh, detection uh, for, um, you know, watching the American, uh, you know, uh, look for the launch of missiles in America. And he detected his radar, his satellites that they had, detected a launch of uh, six missiles uh, from North Dakota heading towards Russia. And his instructions were to launch missiles. To, well, he, would, he wouldn't do it directly, but he'd give it to the command above him, and at that time, you know, there was only a few minutes to make a decision like this. And it's pretty much uh, from records after the, uh, the, you know, the end of the Soviet Union, as we know it, that they probably would have launched the missiles. He, on his own um, determination, decided not to do it, because he didn't think it made sense, and he didn't think the United States would launch only five or six missiles. But um, it turned out later he was, uh, he was both um, rewarded and reprimanded. He was re reprimanded because he didn't write a report. And uh, because it made uh, the uh, satellite, uh, the scientists who uh, created the satellites made them look bad. It turned out that the problem was that in their satellites, they, the infrared imaging m mistook uh, ice crystals that were in the clouds over North Dakota as missile launches. And, uh, you know, I think that those guys probably got in a lot of trouble. But, you know, the, the uh, you know, we don't know what these things can do. You know, They're, they've been reported as uh, groups of objects, you know, and 
it, it seems like we're getting back into another Cold War situation with, uh, you know, hypersonic uh, missiles and all this kind of stuff. Hypersonic missiles uh, move very quickly and they don't follow a normal uh, parabolic trajectory that, uh, you know, normal ICBMs do. They can maneuver and, uh, you know, who's to say? I mean, we just uh, had an incident between Pakistan and, uh, and India. They're nuclear nations. What if, uh, what if one of these things showed up on their radar screens and they decided to launch, uh, you know, an attack on one another because they're, you know, people are scared, uh, you know, they're trying to, uh, you know, people like this are rare, you know, that uh, some people just follow orders, you know, and, um, uh, you know, these things could trigger an accidental war, you know, I mean, uh, we, we don't know what they can do. I mean, they, they may have other capabilities, uh, you know, whether they're, uh, you know, natural phenomena or whatever, we need to understand them because I think it's very dangerous. Also, you, you know, they canceled this uh, Nimitz strike uh, event uh, briefly because these things were interfering. They didn't know what they were. What about accidents with civil and military aviation? I mean, this could, could cause stuff like that, although compared to the previous one, accidental war, it's pretty minor. Um, you know, it, you know, these things might be some kind of threat. Who knows, you know? Uh, if they are, if, you know, if they're real, if we really believe this, it's an existence proof of advanced technology. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think Dr. Taylor talked about this, you know, that if you know something exists, you're going to work a lot harder to see if you can, uh, you know, reproduce it and leads to advances, you know, in technology. And for that reason, uh, we should at least know if they're real or not, you know, really study this stuff. If they're a natural phenomena, uh, they're worth investigating, although, you know, that's probably way down on the list. There's so many things that are worth investigating. And, uh, you know, again, human's curiosity, we should, you know, pursue these things. So th that's my take on it, uh, why we should care about any of this. Uh, and I, you know, I think you're all here because you take this seriously. And uh, that's why I'm here too. So uh, I guess that concludes it for me. So thank you. That's for both of you.